Tonight, the presses are rolling on Australia's first national Sunday newspaper. The newspaper is one more link in the vast chain of a rapidly expanding newspaper, television and publishing empire. The man well, sitting on top of this empire is Rupert Murdoch. At 40 years of age, fast becoming as influential and powerful as fellow colonial newspaper tycoons Beaverbrook and Thompson. This week, the new Tsar of Fleet Street, often assailed by critics for his ruthless, sensational approach to journalism, arrived in Sydney to launch one of his more sophisticated enterprises, the Sunday Australian. The Murdoch Empire is worth $89 million. News Limited, of which he's managing director, publishes some 43 newspapers in Australia and 40 overseas newspapers. A host of magazines under the South Down Press banner. Free handout and specialist newspapers published by Cumberland Newspapers. The group also owns NWS9 Adelaide television station, three radio stations, has an interest in a Wollongong television station and owns festival records. Mr Murdoch. Well, my role has certainly been in building this company, has been to create competition everywhere uh, because we were a very small company to start with and we could just take the opportunities which we could afford. So therefore we tended to take the sick newspapers the ones that weren't worth much, the people felt were about to fold up. And by energy and, and drive and getting people around us who were good, uh, we managed in most cases uh, to turn the corner. Yes. And this is how we've built a, a fairly large company. It's in London that Rupert Murdoch's power is having most impact. His group now holds 43% interest in the news of the world, the British Sunday newspaper with the biggest circulation. Murdoch pruned the deadwood and boosted circulation to six and a quarter millions. The newspaper is editorially brighter, but still contains a strong emphasis on sex and titillation. To keep the presses rolling midweek, the News of the World bought out the ailing morning newspaper, The Sun, for £50,000. Under Murdoch's direction, the circulation of 850,000 more than doubled in a year to 1,750,000 copies a day. This week, it hit 2 million. It was stories like the one on train robber Ronald Biggs which brought both condemnation and kudos on Murdoch. I'm not ashamed of any of my newspapers at all. And I'm rather sick of snobs who tell us that they're bad papers. Snobs who... Um, only read papers that no one else wants. I doubt if they read many papers at all. And whereas on most issues they consider themselves liberals or radicals or something, uh, they, they think they ought to be imposing their taste on everybody else in the community. Uh, naturally, one tries to be tasteful, one tests things on oneself, um, and uh, you don't do things which would offend you or offend anyone in your own home. Um, Sometimes things get through. Sometimes there are things in paper, some of our papers which maybe I would not have chosen, but which, um, uh, on the whole, I'm prepared to take responsibility for that. Despite a suggestion from the British anti-establishment magazine Private Eye, the magnet from down under looked for fresh fields. London Weekend Television. Paul Murphy reports. These are the studios of London Weekend Television the company which provides London with its weekend commercial programmes in competition with the BBC. For some time now, London Weekend has been losing ratings, which of course means it's been losing advertising revenue. But in the last few weeks, Mr Rupert Murdoch has become the company's larger shareholder, and he plans to give the BBC a fight and put the company back on its feet. He's already sunk one million Australian dollars of his own money into the company. And everybody's now wondering how Mr Murdoch is going to get on with the company's big star, David Frost. Relations between the two men have not been very good ever since Mr Frost put Mr Murdoch through the hoops on one of his talk programmes for the republication of the Christine Keeler memoirs in the News of the World. David Frost took flight to America. Since Murdoch took over, seven senior executives, including the managing director, have reportedly left. 
Frost, busy on a promotion tour and on private business in America, refused to comment to Four Corners on the Murdoch takeover. The financial stake in the company of the two men reads like this. Mr. Murdoch has 8.25% of voting shares and about 35% of non-voting equity. David Frost owns 5% of voting shares. But leaving aside this supposed rivalry between the two men, people are now wondering whether Mr. Murdoch can be as successful in British commercial television as he undoubtedly has been in Fleet Street. We will, for the first time, uh, give that company an efficiency and a drive which will enable it to live up uh, to its early promises uh, under which it got the franchise. Why have so many senior executives resigned since you took over? Because I asked them to. Was there any vindictiveness on your part against David Frost after his television interview with you? No, I haven't uh, seen David again since then. I've been in touch with him because his contract is up for renewal in the next few weeks. And um, it just depends how much money he asks. But I'm told he's getting $10,000 a night in Las Vegas this, this week. So I don't know whether we're going to be able to get together. Do you expect him to resign too? Uh, he's not a question of him resigning at all. He is a contract artist who, whose contract has in fact finished. Uh, there's only a question of whether it will be renewed or whether he will uh, go to the BBC or whether he will stay in America. And uh, he's naturally put his talents up to the highest bidder. Yes. I believe, though, you were pretty upset with the interview which he did with you um, after the publication of the Christine Keeler memoirs in the News of the World. Is that so? Yeah, I was damned upset because I was told by him and everyone else that it was going to be a nice uh, pally talk. And it didn't quite turn out the way I expected. Uh, could I've been lulled into a sort of state of unpreparedness. Mm. But that's all past now. You get over these things. Is it true that you sacked your PR following that interview? No, certainly not. No. It's a safe bet that whatever's going on in Fleet Street is being talked about in one of the area's best-known pubs, the White Swan, known to its patrons as the Mucky Duck. Two men with plenty of experience of the London newspaper world are Bill Grundy, who writes for the Daily Sketch and works in television, and Tom Bastow, deputy editor of the New Statesman magazine and an expert on the British press. What murdered Prince and the Sun doesn't really surprise anybody. The Mirror for 30 years was hinting that the, uh, about the female nipple, and he has uh, bared the bosom for the British public. But the British public already sees it on television practically every night, uh, sees simulated sex acts on the stage. So for a permissive age, this is, this is no great breakthrough. I think the real charge to be made is that when it comes to uh, certain antisocial uh, trends which have been or were hoped uh, to be outlawed by press council rulings. Uh, the rehash of the Keeler memoirs, for instance, and the Mrs. Biggs memoirs. I think he, uh, perhaps in the first place, because he was newly arrived at the News of the World, uh, he took bad advice. He ran the Keeler stuff, which was rubbish. Uh, he was prejudged, which was very bad anyway, so nobody came out of that. Uh, on the, the Mrs. Biggs thing, uh, he used a hypocritical get-out that uh, the money that he had paid, reputedly £100,000, was going to these poor, starving children of, uh, of, the, of Biggs, the train robber. Well, that didn't uh, really wash. But I think apart from these two major boobs, plus uh, his use of a, a book which pretends to tell uh, the housewife how to be sexually attractive to her husband. I've read the book. It's a pretty salacious book. It is. And the version that he published was heavily bowdlerized. In short, uh, the women who bought the paper on the off chance of finding out the facts of life uh, got, I think, they got short weight. And this is the charge that should be leveled against Murdoch in that case, that he was giving the customers uh, short weight, not that he was lowering standards, really. I, I would uh, be delighted to say that he dropped that, but in fact, at this very moment, they're running another series called How to Be a Happily Married Mistress, which is almost the same sort of ground it's as the, the sensuous woman. Yeah. And it's basically rather innocent. It's the kind it's of thing innocent. that women's magazines, uh, with very much the same kind of euphemism, have been running for years in this country. And in fact, his new, he seems to be, or his editor, is, seems to be uh, fixated on this uh, sensuous woman, because the news of the world at this moment has been uh, going through yeah, what it right. claims to be 
be an experiment with four couples who uh, have been reading the book and putting it into practice. And the result, of course, could have been printed in my Sunday school magazine yeah, sure. when I was a boy. It's I, so I, I don't innocuous. Think it, it's all I don't hinting. think it's pernicious, this side of things. I think it's just naive, which, strangely enough, is what I consider to be one ingredient in uh, Rupert Murdoch's character. I think he's an immensely shrewd man in terms of business. Clearly, he must be. You don't run two, uh, two or three empires but in different parts of the globe without being shrewd. But when I've talked to him, uh, I've detected a quite attractive naivety, an element of, of openness. I mean, nobody who uh, was Machiavellian would have accepted an invitation to go on the David Frost programme and be interviewed about the Christine Keeler memoirs and believe that the promises made would be kept because they were, those promises were made with forked tongues and he fell into the trap and when I asked him, I said, weren't you a bit naive to do that? He said, yeah. Uh, he would admitted. You? Rupert Murdoch former Geelong Grammar School and Oxford graduate, stepped into the shoes of his famous newspaper father, Sir Keith Murdoch, in 1952. What makes Rupert run? Many believe his drive comes from trying to emulate or outdo his father, but that could be an injustice to his obvious skills as a businessman and newspaper man. Murdoch knows the newspaper business inside out. In the early days of The Australian, it was a common sight to see him at work in the composing room with his shirt sleeves rolled up. Wealth still hasn't soured his enthusiasm for work. Now he controls his empire from London, making regular trips to Australia to keep an eye on things. The Australian was Murdoch's first big gamble, a gamble which almost didn't pay off. After two tough years, the paper began to break even. In 1967, the circulation stood at 73,409. By 1970, it had doubled to 140,449. You consider that the Sunday Australian is a natural extension of the daily Australian venture? Yes, it is, and we think it'll reach a wider audience because there are a lot of people who the, Sunday, who the daily Australian doesn't get to because of problems of distance and so forth. Uh, and commitments within their local communities where they read, they find it more convenient to read a local newspaper, whereas they will certainly read the Sunday Australian. And this is an effort to uh, provide the minority with a viable newspaper. There's a common belief that you're interested in quality papers only to assure yourself of a knighthood. Now, could you answer that one? Sure, I'm not interested in the least in knighthoods. Man in the hot seat in more ways than one at a news conference is editor Bruce Rothwell, an Australian, former deputy editor of London's Daily Mail. In the overheated offices, there are moans about the lack of air conditioning. For Rothwell, there's a natural uncertainty about the operation. It's the first time he's launched a paper. Beneath his quiet, unassuming exterior, there's a nervous energy that keeps the staff on their toes. ...in which she discusses the way the French can sell arms with impunity to anybody in South Africa or anywhere else and yet still have a good relationship with their... With their did you cut it down? I'll give it to you later on. News editor Chris Forsyth joined the Murdoch organisation as defence and diplomatic correspondent. Features editor Mike Williams, a Welshman, a former Fleet Street veteran, previously production editor with The Australian. Editor Rothwell anticipates he won't have complete say in the running of the new paper. Half-jokingly, suggests he's prepared to print the paper upside down if that's the way Murdoch wants it. Just how much interference can he expect? Well, it varies a lot. I certainly talk with them a great deal um, when possible. But um, uh, equally, they have uh, tremendous freedom. I mean, they don't check with me every leading article. Well, I wouldn't, don't think they check with me one in 50. I doubt if they check with me one in 100. But uh, I try and keep it in close touch with them as possible. We, we run a, a, you know, a pretty friendly, yeah. open shop so that we all talk a lot amongst each other. You do have a reputation of being a fairly ruthless boss. now. Um, just how ruthless are you, in your own opinion? I don't think I'm ruthless at all, and um, I think that's entirely um, um, something that's painted by people like yourselves and so on, because they feel that people who run newspapers are somehow remote, somehow very interesting, and they must be uh, sort of great ogres of some sort or other. If they knew the 
and he knew the agonies that uh, uh, people go through when they change uh, their colleagues or executives and so on. But uh, as I said at the beginning, people have, you have certain responsibilities. Uh, it is not just a game, this. One has a responsibility to succeed to a lot of people, not just to shareholders, but to thousands, and almost tens of thousands of employees. And if things start to go wrong, you have to take whatever decisions are necessary um, to correct the situation. In the promotion department, there's a feverish, almost edgy atmosphere preparing the thousand and one things necessary in creating a new newspaper. Someone's forgotten to apply for entry in the telephone directory. There are 600 newsboys' barrows to order, posters to prepare. Uh, we'll have to substitute that photograph. Mr Murdoch doesn't like the photograph of himself used in the promotion kit. It makes him look older than he is. There's a feeling that someone's head could roll unless the photograph is changed. I think that's a bit, he's a little bit apprehensive here. I think that's a very natural photograph of him. It's, 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 like it, it's not too bad. Imaginary or not, there's a strange degree of respect, or even fear, of Rupert Murdoch among his staff, even while he's thousands of miles away in Britain. There's talk that Mr Murdoch doesn't like radicals, more so radicals with beards, that he expects his staff to wear collars and ties and hates shorts. Even so, there are those on the staff who remain unperturbed. Have you been into some funny positions, these models, do Women's editor Arnold Earnshaw doesn't intend to shave his beard off, not for anyone. Certainly not. I've only, uh, I've only had it for about four months, and after all the scratching of the first few weeks, I'm certainly not going to take it off now. What do you think? What reason do you think Mr. Murdoch uh, frowns on beards? No idea. He, uh, he may have been frightened by a bearded man at some time in his life. I don't know. Um, I'm not all that sure that he uh, has this big thing against it. Uh, there's a lovely story about him and suede shoes, which is something he hates, I believe. You don't get on in business if you wear suede shoes. Um, Do you but wear I think suede these, shoes? Um, oddly enough, no. <laughs> I'll keep my beard and not wear suede shoes. <laughs> as far as our journalists go uh, on that uh, minor point of... Um, how they look, then I think when they leave these offices that there are ambassadors, and I hope that when they go to meet people as our representatives, they're presentable. But at the more serious point of their radicalism, what we're looking for is not conservative journalists or radical journalists, we're looking for good journalists. Uh, and I don't mind what their political opinions are, uh, as long as it stays out of their work. Uh, we have a responsibility. We go into people's homes and we're taken on trust for what is printed in our newspapers. And we therefore expect our journalists to be accurate and as objective as possible. You also expect your papers to express an opinion, though, do you? I mean, the papers themselves, and of course in the feature pages, we encourage it. Uh, the Australian, particularly, is an open paper, although it itself has had very radical opinions, in which I've played a large part. Uh, we, well, I think, the first newspaper in Australia, and quite the strongest, to oppose the Australian involvement in Vietnam. We fought it tooth and nail before the commitment was made, before people woke up to the issue. Uh, and I was very much involved in that, I remember. Um, but uh, what we want in our papers is to be open to all opinions. We wouldn't like to see all one side. Uh, we like to see the, you know, the bright young men be able to write feature articles and to express a point of view about the different issues. There but we like to have there. both yes. sides uh, put. Yes. On your last visit to um, Australia, there are rumours that uh, you, in fact, rebuked some of the staff of the Daily Australian for their leftish views. Is that it? No, that's not true at all. I, I, matter of fact, uh, this rumour came about through a misunderstanding. I did express the opinion that there was too much negative uh, material in the paper uh, and that we wanted to balance it. The paper needed some balance. Engaged to write a series of articles for the new paper, James Cameron, top British journalist and author. Cameron's film, newspaper and book accounts of life in North Vietnam under American bombing brought him international fame. In his wry, whimsical style, Cameron turns his eye on Australia. It's the first time he's written for a Murdoch publication. 
his views on Murdoch. Well, I've never actually clapped eyes on him in all my life. I've never seen him. I don't even know what the devil he looks like. I would say that um, he must be two men at once, I would think, because um, in Australia, he is creating a new newspaper. He's giving birth to a paper. Well, that, to me, is good, because <laughs> my personal experience in journalism has been mostly associated with the deaths of newspapers. I mean, I've had three of the bastards sink underneath me, and to uh, actually assist at the accouchement of a new one is a very um, exciting and good experience. What he is doing to British journalism, I don't absolutely feel qualified to say because I gave up reading English newspapers years ago. Um, they all became a most monumental bore to me and the kind of um, success that Rupert Murdoch has had with The Sun uh, doesn't particularly interest me except in a curiously economic sense. I'm surprised that he's made it work, frankly. I think his real taste is for power, and I think it's both uh, political power and, if you like, social power. I think he would like to see his papers moulding uh, and canalising uh, the thought of young people. I think he likes money, I think he likes the good things of life, but I think he also likes what money can do for him in this field of communications, both uh, newspapers and television, where he clearly feels very much at home. All that remains now is to wet the new baby's head. The management throws a launching party, part of the estimated $100,000 promotion for the new paper. If Mr Murdoch's past record is anything to go by, the Sunday Australian is assured of success. Everything he's touched so far has turned to gold. We believe that we are building um, and it's not by any means a one-man effort this, but my colleagues and I believe we are building an international communications company. We're attempting to show uh, that it is both good business uh, and uh, good publishing uh, to take our interests across national borders. Uh, and that's why we're now in the business in Great Britain. Do you see any natural extension now in the in English market? There are stories about your interest in possible interest in the London Times and even boasts, I believe, that you will be taking over the New York Times within 10 years. No, well, I think you can certainly discount the latter. Uh, as for the former, you can discount that too. I think that uh, without any disrespect, I think Lord Thompson might be persuaded to make a gift of the London Times. But uh, we, we have other ideas there.